Good morning. Good morning, church family. Happy Sabbath. And happy early Father's Day to all the fathers, biological, adoptive, spiritual. Thank you so much for being a blessing to our lives and to the greatest and most wonderful father of all, thank our Heavenly Father for Him being our God and Father of all, as the book of Ephesians calls Him. The mystery of uh, His story, or the mystery of His story. What do you think I have here? Hmm? That's a mystery. A mystery to be revealed later. Last year, in 2021, in the month of January, somebody called me and uh, told me, Pastor, I want to ask you something. Actually, the person first texted me and told me, Pastor, I want to call you. I want to ask you something. And I said, okay, no worries. Just call me. And uh, she called and asked me, Pastor, is it true? Are you leaving us? Well, let me give you some context. That was happening in January, and I was going to start my sabbatical in May. According to the policy of Florida Conference, where I served at that time, after seven years of service in that same conference, you could take up to three months of sabbatical. So, uh, I was planning to start sabbatical in May, but for that, I had to make my leadership aware that I will be away for three months. So, uh, that I did in the month of January. Now, in the month of January, I did not know anything else but that I was going to start my sabbatical in May. So when this lady came to me and asked me, are you leaving us? I said, no, I'm not. And uh, then, you know, in April, I was called to come here for an interview. We came, we got a call, we accepted the call, we came here, and um, right after that moment when we accepted the call, the next week I had to announce that in my congregation, first the leadership of the church, because obviously they had to know this was April, in May I was going to start my sabbatical and then never come back to my congregation as the lead pastor of the church. So I had that board meeting. At the end of the board meeting, I let my leaders know that uh, this was the last board meeting I was uh, chairing with them. After the board meeting, Right away, I'm getting a call. <laughs> Guess from whom? <laughs> from that same lady, who was actually the treasurer of the church, who had just recently taken office. So uh, she called me and uh, she had one question. What do you think the question was? Pastor? Why did you lie to me? <laughs> I was like, oh my goodness. Sister, I did not lie. 
Because at that time when you ask me, everything that is happening now to me was mystery. We did not know. Of course, there were some rumors. Of course, people started speaking because they have seen situations where the pastor went on a sabbatical, and then after the sabbatical, never came back to that church. And that happens sometimes, but that is not a rule. So, yeah, mystery. Let me speak to a mystery that you may be interested about. I've been asked, and I'm hearing that some people are asking around in the church, some of my church family members, is Pastor Joe leaving? Let me elucidate that mystery. The answer is no. Unless, unless there is something in the queue I don't know about. If there is a mystery in the queue that I don't know about, don't think I'm lying. But no, well, you may think, okay, but where are the rumors coming from there? Well, this is what happened. In our house, there was a mom-daughter conversation a few months ago in which the mom, my dear wife, explained to her daughter, my dear daughter, <laughs> that uh, we might need to move to another house and that might come with moving to another school for her. And that was supposed to be a secret, a mystery. <laughs> and it was until next day. <laughs> and then the next day, it started like wildfire, and uh, that's how we got to the place where I am clarifying in front of my church family that I'm not unhappy, and I'm not leaving. We are not leaving to another assignment. We are going to be relocating with our living space, but that doesn't entail anything really when it comes to our service or ministry with a church family. Speaking about ministry and mystery, mystery is something that is hidden. It is something that is still covered. It is not revealed. And today we are looking at the book of Ephesus, written by the Apostle Paul to the church in Ephesus, and written to us as well, a section of the book, chapter 3, where there is a lot of speech about mystery. Let us pray and then dive into it. Lord, we want to understand your mystery as much as you want to reveal it to us. So please, through the Holy Spirit, uncover it, unveil it to us in Jesus Christ. Amen. Ephesians chapter 3, verse 1, For this reason, says the Apostle Paul, For this reason... I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you Gentiles. And the word there for Gentiles is ethnos. That's where we get the word ethnic or ethnicity. For this reason, I, Paul, he says, and you may immediately ask, for what reason? What is this reason? Well, the reason is given in the previous chapter 
chapter 2 from verse 19, where he explains, Now, therefore, you are no longer strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens. In Greek, sympolite, or joint citizens. Please notice that little sim or sun is the same little particle that you can find in the word symphony. What does it mean, symphony? It means to sound together. Sun, together. Then you can also find it in the word sympathy. What is sympathy? It means to suffer together with somebody. Sun, pathos, suffer together. We are no longer strangers, the Apostle Paul says, to us, to those from among the Gentiles or the nations or the ethnic groups, but fellow citizens, we are simpolite, joint citizens with the saints and members of the household or the family of God. Verse 20, having been built on the foundation of, of or laid by the apostles and prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, verse 10, 21, in whom the whole building being fitted together grows into a holy temple in the Lord, in whom you also are being built together for a dwelling place of God in the Spirit. So, in short, the Apostle Paul says, Jews and Gentiles, Jews and those from among the nations, together are joint citizens, fellow citizens. They are members of the same family. And then he goes on saying, yes, for that reason, that's verse 1, for this reason I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ Jesus, for you those from among the nations. He drops two bombs right here in verse 1. One is he's a prisoner. Did you know before he was a prisoner when he writes this letter? His letter is so positive, so filled with courage and hope, you would not suspect that somebody behind that letter, the one that writes the letter, is in prison, actually. He's in prison, he says, one bomb. Second bomb, he's in prison be because of the nations, because of the Gentiles. He's in prison. But then he breaks off and he digresses. It seems that he goes in a different direction. He says, if indeed you have heard of the dispensation or administration, or stewardship, or household plan. Yes, that's wor that word from the Greek can, translate it, can be translated in different ways. Administration, stewardship, uh, household plan of the grace of God which was given to me for you. Please notice this is the first time when in this section of the letter he emphasizing he is emphasizing this is a grace of God given to him. The Apostle Paul says, yes, this is a grace of God given to me. Verse 3, how that by revelation or apocalypsis, as the word there, how by revelation he made known to me the mystery, that is, God made known to Paul the mystery, as I have briefly written already, and he refers back to the first section of his letter, verse 4, by which, when you read, you may understand my knowledge or my insight in the mystery of Christ. The Apostle Paul has an insight in the mystery of Christ. He has been given this mystery of God from God Himself. Verse 5, verse 5, which in other ages was not made known to the sons of men as is, has now been revealed by the Spirit of His 
holy apostles and prophets. So what he says is this. There is a mystery of God that has been revealed before to some degree, but it has never been revealed the way it is revealed now through the Spirit, by the Spirit, through His holy apostles and prophets. Verse 6, that the Gentiles or the ethnos, those from among the nations, should be fellow heirs. Again, notice the soon, soon, soon. Fellow heirs or joint heirs of the same body or soon soma, joint body and partakers or joint partakers, or joint beneficiaries of His promise in Christ through the gospel, verse 7, of which I became a minister according to the gift of the grace of God given to me. This is the second time. This is the second time when that same idea is emphasized, that He received a gift of the grace of God. Remember, he is in prison. And somebody in prison speaks about a gift repeatedly, a gift that he received from God, that was given to him by God, by the effective working of his power. What is he speaking about? Well, this is what the Apostle Paul tries to explain. Yes, there has been some revelation of the mystery of God. Some aspects of the mystery of God have been revealed in the past. But there is an aspect, there is some content of the mystery of God that has never been revealed or shown to people the way it is shown or revealed to them now. What is that? And he explains that those coming to Jesus Christ from among the nations and those that come from the Jewish people from among which Jesus Christ himself came, they are joint, they are together, they are fellow. They are joint citizens. They are joint heirs. They are joint body. They are joint partakers of uh, the mystery of the grace of God. But what is this about? In the Old Testament, God was not available to the nations as well. Go for Genesis chapter 12, verse 3, for instance, and read there where God says to Abraham, and in you all the families, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. All the families. And then read, for instance, Isaiah chapter 49, verse 6, I will also give you, you my servant, as a light to the Gentiles, that you should be my salvation to the ends of the earth. One of you may say, yes, pastor, that is true. But all of that was fulfilled in Jesus Christ later on. And to some degree, you may be right. But let me ask you, when God sent Jonah to Nineveh, was Jonah sent to a Jewish town, to a Jewish city? Was Nineveh a Jewish town? No. That was a pagan, as pagan as it could be. And God uses somebody from among His people, from among Israel, and sends that person there to bring the gospel to those pagans. And that person, the evangelist, knows God's character. He doesn't even want to go. Why doesn't he want to go? Because he knows if he goes there and the people get converted, what will God do? God will flip it. He will change His mind. 
And it seems that the missionary has a problem with God's character. He doesn't like the fact that God may change his mind with regard to the destruction of Nineveh if they start to get to know about God's mystery. <laughs> now, of course, there is something in the Old Testament that can be very disturbing when it comes to the nations. And that moment is when Israel, coming out of Egypt, conquers the land of Canaan. And uh, probably each one of us have had this question at least once. What is going on there? Is that a genocide ordered by God Himself? Is that some sort of an ethnic cleansing or racial cleansing? Well, first of all, if you read the Bible carefully, you will see that the reason why the partial destruction of the peoples in Canaan happened was not some sort of ethnic or racial bias on God's side. What happens there is a result of idolatry, immorality, and iniquity. There's some sort of abysmal wickedness going on there in Canaan with those nations. And second, it was not God's initial plan to use the Israelites to destroy those nations. God says, and you have um, Bible verses like the one in Exodus in which God explains to them, I will send hornets before you which shall drive out the Hivites, the Canaanites, and the Hittites from before you. In other words, God was going to drive out those nations, send them somewhere else, I don't know where, I don't know what He wanted to do with them, but God's initial plan was for those nations to move out from their way. Because God had given that land to Abraham. Of course, that still keeps some questions open because what happened in history was something different than the initial plan of God. And I'm not here to simplify or make God easy to understand. It is complicated. It is complex to understand what really happened there and why it happened the way it happened. What I'm trying co to convey, though, is that even in the Old Testament, some aspects of the mystery of God with regard to how God relates to the nations, to every nation, was revealed. But there was also some limitation to it. The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 speaks about some sort of blindness, some sort of some sort of veil that covered the eyes, the sight of those that should have revealed that mystery. It is difficult to understand to what degree they refused to reveal the mystery of God to the nations because it seems that God wanted to use the people of Israel as a light to all the nations and also as the venue through which, to, through which, or the avenue through which, he would bring in the Messiah, the ultimate light of the nations. It seems, however, that there was some sort of inability as well with the people of Israel because they were blind and there was some sort of veil. For until this day, the same veil remains unlifted in the reading of the Old Testament because the veil is taken away in Christ, the Apostle Paul says. Verses 15 and 16 continue, 15 and 16. But even to this day, when Moses is read, a veil lies on their hearts. Nevertheless, when one turns to the Lord, that is Jesus Christ, the veil, the veil is taken away. Yes. And this here is the Tanakh. That's the, the rabbinic translation of the Old Testament of the law of Moses, the Psalms, or the writings, and the prophets. 
in Jesus Christ, the veil is taken away. And everybody should know, everybody is informed with regard to the mystery of God, how he relates to every nation. And the text goes on in uh, Ephesians chapter 3. To me, the apostle says, to me who am less than the least of all the saints. This grace was given, again, the third time. The grace was given to him that I should preach among the Gentiles, among the nations, the unsearchable riches of Christ, verse 9, and to make all see, to make all see what is the fellowship or the administration of the mystery which from the beginning of the ages had been hidden in God who created all things through Jesus Christ, verse 10 to the intent that now, now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities or rulers and powers or authorities in the heavenly places. And here I need to stop a little bit and explain. When we speak about the mystery of God, most of the time what comes to mind is the plan of salvation. That is, that God from eternity had a plan that in case something goes wrong with humanity, He would intervene, He would step in and try to save humanity and bring humanity back into harmony with the whole universe. But if you read what Paul says here, that it was God's intent that now the manifold wisdom of God might be made known by the church to the principalities and powers in the heavenly realms, in the heavenly places, you get the impression this is something more than just the plan of salvation for humans. What Paul says is that extraterrestrial beings, beings that we may call generically angels, are looking into what is happening with us on this earth. They are looking into how the mystery of God is revealed and how the mystery of God is applied on this earth. There is something that even they try to understand. And when Paul says, principalities or rulers and powers in the heavenly, here he speaks about both good and bad angels. Because we know from the Bible that there are angels that are on God's side and angels that are on the enemy's side. So there is something happening in the plan of salvation in which angels try to look and they try to understand. The Apostle Paul also expresses this same idea differently in uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 4, verse 9. Look what he says. For we have been made a spectacle. The word there in Greek is theatron. What is the, the English word for that? Theater. So in other words, we are a theater to the whole universe. I don't know if you've seen what a Roman or Greek theater looked like. That theater was a huge space where people would sit and go all the way up, and something was happening down, all the way down, and everybody could have visibility and see what was going on down there. This is the picture. Something is happening, and God wants to put that on display in the church, by the church, through the church, to show the whole universe the way God operates, the mystery of God, reveal the mystery of God, so that the whole universe can see that Everybody in Jesus Christ is joint 
joint what? Joint heir, joint body, joint partaker or beneficiary of the grace of God. Nobody is more or less. Everybody is at the same level. And the text goes on in Ephesians explaining that indeed this was the eternal purpose of God accomplished in Christ Jesus our Lord, verse 12, in whom we have boldness and access with confidence through faith, of him, or in him, the Greek text says, faith of him. And I believe the best translation there is through his, that is Christ's faithfulness, as the ISV has it. So, we all, everybody, all nations have boldness and access with confidence to Christ's faithfulness to us. And verse 13 Therefore, Paul says, I ask that you do not lose heart, do not faint at my tribulations for you, which is your glory. Remember, that's how he started. I, Paul, the prisoner of Christ, he's in prison, but he's in prison because of the Gentiles. And now he says, don't worry. Don't lose heart, don't faint, don't lose your courage, don't feel like something terrible is happening to me because of you, because that's not the case. What is happening to me is a gift of God's grace to me. I take it as a gift of God's grace. But you would wonder, why does Paul become so apologetical with regard to those in Ephesus? Well, there's something in the way he was arrested. Because remember, he is now in prison. You may ask, how did he get there? Well, he went on a mission trip. A mission trip from among other cities. You can pick the city of Ephesus because that's where he spent most of his time during that mission trip. But at one point, he goes back to Jerusalem, and there in Jerusalem, he goes to the temple. In the temple, or at the temple premises, some people, some Jews from Asia, and Ephesus is in Asia, see him, they lay hands on him, and they start crying, shouting, or yelling like crazy. Ephes, um, Acts chapter 20, verse 21, verse uh, 28 says, Men of Israel, help! That's what they were shouting there. Men of Israel, help! What do you think when somebody shouts like that? There's a danger there. What's the danger? This is the man who teaches all men everywhere against the people, the law, and this place. And furthermore, he also brought Greeks into the temple and uh, has defiled this holy place. What is their problem? Their problem is, allegedly, that Paul brought Greeks and defiled the temple. Who were the Greeks? The Greeks were people from among the Gentiles, from among the nations. And if you read on, you will see that there was a guy, Trophinus, from Ephesus, that they saw at the temple or around the temple, and they thought Paul brought that guy there. And because they thought Paul brought that guy, now they are shouting and they are trying to kill Paul. The mob grabs him, drags him out of the court of the temple, and they want to kill him unless the Romans intervene because it, Jerusalem is under Roman occupation. If they don't intervene, he would be gone. But what happens is, because he's also a Roman citizen, he asks that he would be treated and judged according to the Roman law, 
and long story short, he ends up in Rome in house arrest. House arrest in that, times, in that time means that he is in chains, but he can even invite people to him to have interaction with them, and he invites the Jews. Look what uh, Acts 28 says, Acts 28 verse 20, he invites the leaders of the Jews in Rome to him, and he says, for this reason, therefore, I have called for you to see you and speak with you, because for the hope of Israel, I am bound with this chain. But this is somewhat different from what we heard before, because he tells them he is bound with this chain for the hope of whom? Not the Gentiles? Israel? Well, Israel and the Gentiles. Because in a way, it was those from among Israel that put him in prison. But the reason why he was put in prison or the reason of the uproar was the nations, the Gentiles. That's why in uh, verse 13, he kind of tells them, hey guys, don't stress out because of me. Don't think you've done something wrong or I'm suffering because of you because what is happening to me is actually a gift of God to me. Yes, I am in prison, but this is not your fault. Don't take it as if I am suffering because you are at fault. No, I'm here as a gift of God. And I'm here because I have an insight of the mystery of God. An insight or a revelation of the mystery of God that has not been seen before. That nations, all nations and Jews are together. And this was the belief. This was the deep-seated theology, theological missiology of the church in the first century, to the point where the Apostle Paul and others would rather embrace prison than stop preaching the mystery of God to everybody, to all the nations. Why is it important to emphasize this? Because if you look at the history of Christianity, you will see that throughout the history of Christianity, what is happening is way less than what we learn from the Apostle Paul. In the history of Christianity, I see Christians that hide the mystery of God from others, from the nations, or from some nations at least, on a purpose. They try to put the veil back on the mystery of God. And I'm thinking about those times where Christianity was hiding the basis, the fundamentals of Christianity, chaining the Bible to the posts of a church or cathedral, not allowing people to get the mystery of God. When I look at Christianity, at the history of Christianity, I also see Christians that look at some from among the nations as being subhumans or under the level of humanity. Therefore, they are not worthy of receiving the mystery of God. So why reveal the mystery of God to them? And when I say this, I think about slavery. I think about colonial treatment of uh, natives all around the world. When I look at the history of Christianity, I also see people, Christians, people that call themselves Christians, 
that would like to hide at least parts of the mystery of Christ so that they can treat some, at least some from among the nations, as being anything but joint heirs, joint body, or joint partakers of God's grace to the gospel. And those are painful realities. And if I read history well, we need to know, we need to be aware of those realities because those kind of realities can come back if they have not come back, if they have ever left us. We are Seventh-day Adventists. And one of the beauty of the theology of Seventh-day Adventists is that we believe we have a mission to the entire world to go and preach the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people. You may know that last Sabbath, the 61st session of the GC, of the General Conference, ended. And uh, throughout the week, not this last week, the week before, I tried to follow to see what the process was and it's very interesting to see how in those business sessions you have people lined up to speak, to use that mic and uh, say something to the floor. People from all backgrounds, people that look so much different, people that sound so much different, people that have different ideas in mind, but it's such a blessing to know that we are all joint, joint heirs, joint body, joint partakers. One of the highlights of those GC sessions for me have always been those uh, final moments of the parade of the nations. I don't know if you've ever seen that. Have you ever been at the GC, at a GC session and seen the parade of the nations when they march with the flags? Well, usually they march, march under the flag of a nation uh, representing those nations where there is Seventh-day Adventist presence. This year, it seems they did something different beyond or beside those nations where there is Seventh-day Adventist presence. They also lined up the flags of those nations where there is no Seventh-day Adventist presence as of yet. And the flags were on stage, something like 20 flags, you can see that. And uh, the re-elected GC president, uh, Pastor Ted Wilson, was addressing the floor. And he was saying something, I want to read he says, before you, you see the flags of countries that are yet to be reached in a very meaningful way. You see division presidents seated in front of these flags. And he goes on. He goes on. Our mission is to take the gospel to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people around this globe. We have yet a work to do. And beyond that, in all the countries that have been entered, we still have much to do. Then later he adds, what a privilege for us today to commit our lives from here until the Lord returns to not only entering these countries in a meaningful way, but to enter every home, every community, every region of this globe. And I thought this was very interesting. And I thought this was something to really applaud. That we are thinking about those areas of the globe, most of those areas being in the 4040 window, if you know what that is. The 4040 window is made of countries, mostly of Muslim religious background. Everything was fine until next morning. And next morning, 
There was all kind of rumors flying via social media. Ted Wilson has compromised and we have become Babylon. We pacted with Babylon and uh, we apostatized at the highest level. And I'm looking at some of those titles because you start receiving those. You know, and I'm asking myself, what was wrong? And then I discovered what was wrong, at least to some. That on stage among those countries that have not been reached yet, and we should reach, there was a yellowish flag, the flag of the Vatican. Yeah, and that hit a nerve to some people. So now the question is, should we preach the gospel? Should we reveal the mystery of God to every nation, tribe, tongue, and people except the Vatican? Well, I'm just using this as an illustration. These are things that are happening. I'm just presenting what the Apostle Paul teaches. The Apostle Paul teaches that we all are joint citizens in Jesus Christ. Of course, if we accept Jesus Christ as the Savior of our lives. But if that's the case, Matthew 24, the book of Revelation, it all speaks about the gospel being taken to every nation, every tribe, every tongue, every people. So I want to challenge you this Sabbath morning. How do you feel about these things? Do you have in your heart, in your mind, some people that may be marching under one flag or the other that you think, yeah, I think the gospel should be preached to everybody except these. And we should, I believe, search our own hearts, not in the sense of compromising our faith and becoming alike or in any way less than what Jesus Christ shows us and being creative in Jesus Christ because that's the premise of the Apostle Paul's teaching. His faithfulness creates faithfulness to Him in us. But the question is, and I need you to search yourself, do we, do we indeed reveal the mystery of God to everybody? Please, don't hide. Don't hide the mystery of God. Reveal it to everybody in your neighborhood. When you look around, there may be people that may look like they could be good recipients of the mystery of God. How about those that may not look like that to the deformed sight of a human being? Also, think about this. Do we want to use prophecy? Because as Seventh-day Adventists, we have more understanding or we should have more understanding of the mystery of God because we are interested in prophetic insights as well. Do we want to use prophecy as a hindrance to the gospel itself or we want to use prophecy to be even more emboldened and encouraged to reveal the mystery, the mystery of Christ, because the mystery of Christ is the history of salvation. And the book, the seven sealed book, is being little by little brought to the moment of opening. And Revelation chapter 10, verse 7 says, And then the mystery of God will be finished. 
what are we doing in the wake of the historical realities, prophetic insights for history coming up in the wake of those God's mystery actions. How do we become part of his story, of his story, and reveal his mystery? And that's something I need you to answer on an individual level. I would